the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. And without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And Him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not recognize it. The light shines through the darkness, but the darkness didn't even notice. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Even in his own land and among his own people, he wasn't wanted. But to those who believed him, to those who believed in his name, to those who believed he was how he claimed and would do what he said, he gave the right to become children of God. And we have seen his glory, the glory that a one and only son can only receive from his father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became human and lived here on earth among us. And having become human, he stayed human. He humbled himself. He didn't accept any special privileges. He lived a selfless, obedient life to die a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that crucifixion. But it was our sins that did that to him. He was bruised and wounded for everything that we've done wrong. He was wounded for our transgressions, pierced for our iniquities. He did all this just so we could be whole. And God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus is the master of all. This is the resurrection, that the Son came and gave his life, that he extended an invitation to know the God of all creation, that he offered us love when we knew no peace, that he offered us relationship when all we knew how to do was keep and break a bunch of rules. This is the resurrection, that in his death we have come to know life, that we can freely offer our life to him. Good morning, saints. Happy Fourth of July. As we gather together this morning, this is the day where our nation celebrates freedom. We take one day, although we can celebrate that every day. But think about the freedom that we have in who this, this opening video was just talking about. Think about the chains that have been broken. Think about the lives that have been transformed through the blood of the Son of God. And in this, we don't celebrate it just one day, but we celebrate it every day, all day, 365 days a year. The one who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So as the musicians play in the prelude this morning, and as the opening song is sung, let us consider this morning the freedom that we have in him.
more than a friend or life to me. While I walk this pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with thee. Portion more than friend or life to me. All along this tedious journey. Let me walk with thee, oh, Master, let me walk with thee, all along this tedious Let me walk with thee. Oh, my Savior, let me walk with thee. All along this tedious journey. It's time for our morning prayer. And so this morning, as we go before the Lord, we want to keep in mind those in our congregation who have suffered loss of family members and loved ones, those who are dealing with physical ailments and hospitalizations and procedures that are um, upcoming or have been performed. We want to think about those around our country and around the world who are dealing with devastation and tragedy. We want to keep those people in Florida in mind who are dealing with the loss of loved ones even unaccounted for in the collapse of that apartment complex. And so there is much to pray for. There is much to be concerned about. There is much to take before the Lord, but we serve a big God who is able. And so this morning I'm asking you to join me in prayer as we go before our big God and ask his intervention. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to be present today. Lord, we thank you for bringing us through this past week and the successes and the challenges, the things, Lord, that were seen and unseen for the unexpected and the expected. We know that you walked with us through it all. 
we know that you never leave us. We know that you never forsake us. And so, Father God, we give you thanks at this time for your greatness and your faithfulness. Father God, we ask your forgiveness for our shortcomings and our sins. Lord, we ask that you would just simply, as you have promised in your word, help us to turn to the one who is the mediator, who intercedes on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives, who guides and protects and rebukes as needed. Father God, we thank you for your word that just solidifies our faith, strengthens who we are, and Lord, gives us ammunition against the enemy. Father, we ask today that you would just meet the needs of those who stand in need this morning, whether it is a physical touch, Lord, whether it's emotional concerns, whether there are family members that we're concerned about for one reason or another, Lord, we just bring it before you. And we ask that you would, Father, just first of all, calm our hearts and give us confidence to know that all we need to do is to enter boldly to the throne of grace. Father God, we pray for our world. Father, for natural disasters. Father, for man-made disasters. Father, for the unrest and uneasiness that is present. Lord, we know that in your presence there is peace. And so, Father God, we just pray that you would impart that peace to us in our hearts, that we know we are at peace with you, and that we might spread that peace to those around us. Father God, we pray for our service this morning, for every note that is played, every word that is sung, every word that is spoken. Father God, we pray that you would just be in it and that you would be exalted. You would be glorified. You would be magnified this day. We ask, Lord, as we observe the Lord's Supper today, that we might appreciate this commemoration of the death of our Lord, what he has done for us, and that through his death, we have life. And so we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Pray for our congregation that we might continue to stay strong and focused. And Lord, as we continue to open the church up, Lord, may we be open to what you desire to do in our lives, through our work, through us in this community. And we ask this with great boldness, knowing that you hear us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It is time for us to pause our lives and to participate in the observance of the communion meal. And as is our custom here at Bethany, whenever we provide the um, elements that represent communion, we provide an explanation as to why we do what we do here in remembrance of Christ Jesus. And that's exactly what it is that this communion meal represents what Christ has done for us on the cross. And we should pause our lives. We should stop everything we're doing, everything we're thinking about, and remember back what he has done for us on the cross. For praise the Lord for what he has done. We, there was a time when the Jews celebrated Passover, and this communion meal transcends what was done or commissioned by the Jews to do. It's not when, when the, the punctuation between the Old Testament and the Passover, 
and the New Testament and the new church is not a comma, it's a period. Because this is something new. It's an establishment of the church. And the establishment of the church is what Christ has done for us on the cross and his resurrection. And as often as we do it, we need to remember what he has done. So let's read together a scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. And if we could put that on the screen. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. Praise the Lord. So the deacons will pass out the communion elements. And those at home, would you please, if you have your communion elements prepared, will you partake with us in this communion? For it is commune, as in together, as a church body, that we are going to participate in this meal. Because the elements that we're using today are new to Bethany, we have a very short video just to show, show you just how to open these elements. Very short.
Thank you. Now, the next scripture I want us to read together is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And eat the bread element, please. And then let us read together verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do, 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 you shall, I'm sorry, ye, sh, do, ye, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. In verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for what you have done for us on the cross. Lord, you have definitely just given us, Lord, things that we never even could have imagined, for we were dead in our sins. And because of what you did for us on the cross and in the resurrection, we have newness of life. We are a family together because of the bond we share with you. And we thank you for this, O oh Lord. And we thank you for this observance in which we pause to just remember what you've done for us on the cross. And help us, O oh Lord, to always just be mindful of just the love and grace which you have shown us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
in me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, and given that today is a holiday, uh, I'm not going to keep you party people too long. Uh, <laughs> and so this morning, I just really want to, um, as opposed to, I, as I thought about this, not so much a sermon, uh, but a reminder that there is often opportunity for us to be reminded of what we have in Christ. Um, not to say that we're not appreciative and not to say that we're forgetful, but sometimes we just get so kind of burdened down uh, and, and sidetracked with so many different things that it is very easy to forget who you are and what you have because of what he's done. And so this morning, um, I have a portion of a passage of scripture that will be the basis for our discussion. And that's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And it's actually up there on the screen. Uh, and Paul writes these words. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And I want to speak to you this morning and remind you that you, as a Christian, have the best seat in the house. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you would give us just clarity. A lot of times, uh, it just, it's very easy to become distracted. And in some cases, to be even unappreciative, forgetful, lazy. And Lord, we pray that you would, in those times, that you would just goad us, that you would just prod us to be driven by your spirit back to your word, back to fellowship and communion, back to understanding the privilege we have to be called a child of the king. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would do just that, that you would simply remind us, lay it on us, what we have and who we are, and the responsibility that is ours because of it. We ask this, Lord, in the matchless name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we celebrate our freedom. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. 
Several years ago, I had to take a business trip, and uh, I, I had to get on a plane. I can't even remember where I was going at, at, at this particular time. But uh, I remember I, I boarded the plane at Pittsburgh International Airport. And when I got on the plane, one of the uh, flight attendants uh, looked at me, and he said, Mr. Glaze. And so I looked at him, and uh, he said, I don't know if you remember me. He said, but uh, when you were a manager in one of our stores, I worked for you. And so as I, as I looked at him, I remembered the young man. Uh, and we started having a conversation about uh, where he had gone and obviously had started working for the airlines and how he enjoyed his job. But one of the things he said to me is, I really appreciate how you treated me as an employee. It's always good to hear, especially years after the fact. <laughs> and so I took my seat. And as I was sitting there, a few minutes goes by, and another flight attendant comes up and leans over and goes, Mr. Glaze? And, and I went, yes. And they went, can you follow me, please? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord. <laughs> they can throw me off the plane. I don't know what I did. And so I'm following this flight attendant, and she's going towards the front of the plane. And she goes through this little cordoned off area. And it's all nice. The seats are fluffy. And I'm like, she said, you can sit right here. Huh? She said, you can sit right here. And so I sat down, and she said, the young man that he told us that he used to work for you and how well you treated him. And we just wanted to show you our appreciation because he is a great employee, and we appreciate you taking care of him. It blew my mind, saints. And I will tell you, that is the first and only time I've ever ridden in first class in my life. And if you've never done it, it is nice. But I realized that as I think, thought about that situation, as I think about that situation, that I was given that treatment because of how I treated that young man. But I had no authority to get up from my seat on my own and go to the front of that plane and sit in first class. No authority. As a matter of fact, had I tried to do it on my own, they would have probably escorted me off the plane. But because somebody who had authority looked at me with favor and said, bring him up front, I was now given the opportunity where I had no authority to step into a realm that I would not have been afforded to be in had it not been for someone else. Can I tell you, saints, that is what Jesus did? We were in coach going to hell. But he brought us up to first class to take us into the presence of the Father. Praise be his name. And so when I think about this passage, I love, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Because it simply reflects that story that I told. Somebody took me somewhere that I had no authority to be able to go on my own, nor any desire in my own flesh. Paul tells us that in this passage, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were walking according to this world's perspective. You were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. But God, I love that passage, verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, he did something. And the Bible says in this passage that he raised us up together and made us sit together. Amen. That's powerful right there. He raised us up together and made us sit together. Now, I'm not going to get too theological this morning, but I think it's important to note that when Jesus went up, in God's mind, you went up. See, I think my sitting in heavenly places 
happened in, oh, you know, early 1984 when I was sitting in my kitchen living room and I was convicted by the Spirit of God about my sin and needing to trust Jesus Christ. See, as I think about it, I think about that's when I went up. But, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when he went up, I went up. Because God in his omniscience knew that a long time down the road, this brother was going to come to faith. And when Jesus sat in the heavenly realms, I sat with him. But more importantly, saints, I sit with him. And so I want to give you four things this morning when we think about this seat we've been given and how we should simply cherish the blessing that God has bestowed upon us in Christ. Four things. The first one I want you to see, and you can uh, go to that first slide, is perspective. We have a different perspective. Um, let, me, let me share this with you real quick, and, and again, I'm not going to get into any detail on this, but one of the things I will have to admit is that I got very distracted by politics. Very. And it's a sensitive and touchy subject, and we all have certain ways that we feel about it, but I got very distracted by it. And we were doing a class on current events, and Pastor had the subject of politics. And I, I said to myself, I'm glad he got that one. I'm glad he got that one, because I, I, I wouldn't want to have to tackle that one. The one thing that jumped out at me and struck me right between the eyes is this. That on the graphic, Pastor had an elephant and he had a donkey. We all know what that represents. In the middle, he had a lamb. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. In the middle, he had a lamb. Sometimes we get so distracted by the donkey and the elephant, as believers, we forget about the lamb, the one who was slain before the foundation of the world, the one who has the ability, listen, not just to change my mind from a political perspective, but to change my situation with regard to my sin and my standing with God. And saints, that slapped me right in the face and it brought me right back to the middle. Sometimes our perspective can be off. And it doesn't necessarily have to be politics. It can be a number of things. But since we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ, our view and our perspective must be different. In Christ, our mindset and attitude has been elevated, and we have the ability to see the world through his eyes. There's a passage in Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Very familiar passage. But the Bible tells us, Paul is encouraging believers. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But then in verse 2, he says this, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He has a desire to renew our minds. He has a desire for us to walk in that. And as we walk in that, and as he changes our perspective on things, we don't look at it like everybody else does. It is so easy to complain. As a matter of fact, we love to complain. I, 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 you know what, it, it, was a, it was a lesson to me a couple of weeks ago on how much we like to complain. I was driving down the street and I noticed on a side road, there was a car that had come to a stop, but then it looked like they were gonna go. Now I'm, I got right away, and, and, and it looked like they were gonna go, and as I'm driving, I'm like, I wish you would. Think about that. I wish you would. Give me a reason 
to complain. Give me a reason to get angry. Give me a reason to be upset. We do it. I wish you would. How about wishing they won't? How about wishing God give me grace in, in, in my, my attitude and my perspective with regard to this situation? How about God calm my spirit if I'm just looking to get into it with somebody? Calm me down, Lord. Change my mind. Change my perspective. In 2 Corinthians 2.16, Paul tells us, this is powerful, saints. He says, we have the mind of Christ. Years ago, there was a commercial. I think it was the United Negro College Fund. You remember the, the tagline? A mind is a terrible thing to, to waste. Can I tell you something, saints, that the mind of Christ in you is a terrible thing to waste? He has cleaned us. He has renewed us. He has changed us. And for us to just kind of keep skidding back to the same old stuff, we are wasting the mind of Christ. Perspective. Our daily prayer should be, Lord, help me in my outlook. Help me in my perspective. Help me in terms of how I see things. I'll say this and, and move to the next point. I, I, and again, I, I speak for myself. I know that when the complain train is running at work, I'm standing on the platform waiting for it to stop <laughs> so I can get on. Because I got some gripes. I got some issues. Saints, Jesus took care of your gripes and issues. He handled those. I'm not saying we don't have problems. I'm not saying we don't have concerns. I'm not saying we're, there's not issues we shouldn't be concerned about. But when we let those things eat at us, and when we demonstrate our concerns in such a way, people wouldn't know who we belong to. Our perspective has to be right. Perspective. The second thing that I want you to see with regard to these things we have as we're seated in the heavenlies is presence. Presence. Um, years ago when we were, I was, I was, I think I was probably about 13, um, I had an aunt who lived in Monroeville, and my cousins used to come in from out of town, and we would spend the summer up at her house. She had a big basement, and so we'd go down in the basement, and it was just free reign. We had a blast. And I remember one year, one of my cousins from New Jersey brought a tape recorder. And they brought this tape recorder, and, you know, we were 12, 13-year-old uh, kids, and so we started to, you know, say things into the tape recorder that you probably don't necessarily want to have repeated. As a matter of fact, you didn't want to have those things repeated. And I mean, we said a bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff. <laughs> and I remember, um, he's passed on now, but I had an uncle named Robert. My uncle Robert, was, he was unique. He was, he was really a unique person. Um, but I remember he came down into the basement, and he used to always wear suits. Like, even if he wasn't going nowhere, he had a sport coat on, he had slacks on, he would come down. And I remember he sat on the couch, because we were playing back what we had said, laughing, having a blast. And he sat on the couch, and he just sat there. And I remember he, he sat there, and he folded his hands, and he leaned forward and just listened. Now, I'm going to tell you that, as I can recall, I was the first one to leave the room <laughs> out of sheer embarrassment. I was the first one. And as I left the room, I could hear other feet following me. It was my cousins. They were leaving the room until the only one left in the room was Uncle Robert and the tape recorder. <laughs> and saints, can I tell you, he didn't have to say a word to us. 
He, he didn't have to say a word. His presence said it all. Believers must live in the knowledge that we are in Christ. We are always in his presence. And our lives are open to his scrutiny, his encouragement, his rebuke, and so on. I was, I was watching a, um, a video on YouTube this week, and the video was called, What Do You Think Is the Scariest Passage in the Bible? And um, the person who was doing the video was using the passage where it says, too much is given, much is required. He said, to me, that's the scariest passage in the Bible because it talks about accountability. But other people start chiming in as to what they thought the scariest passage was. I'm going to be honest with you. It, can somebody bring up Hebrews chapter 4? Hebrews chapter 4. And that should be Hebrews 4, 12 through 16. But if you, if you can bring that up, I, I would love for that to be on the screen uh, so that we can all look at it together. Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, verse 12. Okay. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Stop right there. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Scurry. When you can't figure out where I'm coming from or where I'm going, he already knows. When I can't even figure out. Can you go to the next verse? Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The word there where it talks about opened is the word from which we get our word tracheotomy. tracheotomy. You know what a tracheotomy is? It's when they slice it open and fold it out so they can see, the doctor can see everything that's going on. Now, if you're still sitting there and you're not scared, you're a super saint. <laughs> you're a super saint. Because what this says, saints, is this, that there is nothing even in the most innermost part of my being that escapes the knowledge of God. The psalmist said, you know my inward parts. Even before I was born. Knowing that, saints, helps us understand that we constantly live in his presence. The other, uh, back in the notes, verse that I have, and you don't have to go there, but it's Revelation chapters 2 and through 4. And the reason why I highlight that is back in Revelation chapter 1, John saw the exalted Christ, and he had all of these descriptors to talk about what he saw, the head and hair that was white, the feet that were like burned in fire. But he gives a description of his eyes, and he says his eyes were like flaming fire. Many believe that that is, a, that is significant with regard to his ability to see all things, his omniscience. And in Revelations chapter 2 and 4, remember, he is talking to the churches. And one of the things that he says continually to these churches is, I know thy works. Now, we take that very lightly. Jesus knows what we do. Jesus says, I know your works. I know your works. And you're working hard, and you're laboring, and you're doing all this stuff. And to everybody else, you are on point. But he told the church at Ephesus, you have lost your first love. See, everybody else can't see it. Mm. Not evident to other people. But you're not where you were. 
you're not where you need to be. And the scary thing, saints, is he knows it and he sees it. But the beautiful thing is he calls it and calls us back to himself. We live in his presence because we are in him. So perspective, presence. The third thing is power. Um, my kids, I have awesome kids and awesome grandkids and awesome great grandkids. They give really good gifts like birthdays, Christmas, Father's Day. And um, my kids for Father's Day gave me a new chair for my office. Now, I like my old chair because my old chair, you know, it could lean back and it had a little um, uh, foot rest thing that you could slide out and, you know, put your feet up and it was nice. But I was, I was looking through some stuff and I saw this chair and I was like, ooh, that'd be a good Father's Day gift. And I dropped that one to my wife. I said, you know, you might want to drop this past the kids. <laughs> Father's Day. So come Father's Day, they hook me up. What do I like about this chair? I like this chair because there's a little device on the side that if you hit it, <laughs> right? And it do, look, look, there's a couple different kind of, it's a pulsing vibration where it goes from the bottom of the chair all the way up your back, or it can massage your, your thighs and your back, lower back. I mean, this thing is the bomb. And I just sometimes, <laughs> I sit in my office, and I'm, I'm in that vibrating chair, and I'm like thinking, my kids, thank you, kids. You know, you know. <laughs> I like this chair because it has power. It does things differently than the other chair that didn't have the device, didn't have the mechanism, didn't have the ability to do what this chair does. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ because our Savior has been seated in a place of power and authority, and as his people, we share in his power. In Acts chapter 1, he told this scared bunch of ragtime itinerant preachers, you will receive dunamis after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Think about it, saints. He is telling these individuals that you are going to be witnesses. These, these same people that were scared, they were hiding. He's saying to them, you're going to receive power, and they won't be able to shut you up or shut you down. He gives us power to tell it, to tell the message, to witness of his goodness. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, he gives us the power to live righteously. We don't have to stumble through life complaining that I messed up again. You're going to mess up. You're going to. But praise God, he has given us the ability and the power to live right. And in Revelation 12, I love this passage where he talks about the, the dragon and the dragon is unleashing his fury on God's saints. It said, but they overcame him by the word and by the blood of the lamb and they loved their lives not unto death. We have power, saints. He didn't leave us here helpless. He didn't leave us here hopeless. But when he left, he said, I will send another. See, I, I, I love pastor because pastor gets into breaking down the, 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 the Greek words. And, uh, you know, that, that word another in the Greek is the word alos. And it could mean another of a different kind. It's another of the same kind. I am sending someone else who will be just like me, although he will be able to be in each of you. That's power. That's power. So we have perspective, we have presence, we have power, 
And then we have purpose. Purpose. The next slide. Um, we just finished our vacation Bible adventure. And um, we had, what, about 20 kids? Somewhere around there? Um, first of all, thank you to everyone who supported that and participated in that. It was a wonderful uh, four days of just learning about God, our incredible God. But one of the things that happens, and I, I, I see this every time we do it, it shows me how in tune our kids are with God and with the scriptures. Listen, and with what they learn from us. Now, Cynthia was doing a song, and in the song, it said, on the seventh day, God rested. So one of the little participants came up to me while the song was still going on, and he said, okay, she just said God rested. How did God rest? Like, God don't get tired? Amen. Yeah. He learned something, right? He knew that God does not get tired. God does not sleep. God does not slumber. But, but you just sang he rested. So I had to become all theologian on him and break it down. You know. I said, when we talk about God resting, it's not that he got tired or he got sleepy. He just stopped working. It's just a reference that he didn't create anything else after that. He stopped working. That's, it's, just, it's just a simple explanation. He went, oh, okay. Too often when we think about rest, we think about leisure. I remember um, when I, years ago, went to Hardy Bible School, and they would talk about when Jesus finished the work of redemption, he sat down, and they called it majestic rest. And I always thought that was really cool. But it, it, it really began to dawn on me that when Jesus sat down, the work in terms of the day-to-day -day was really just starting. The work of salvation was finished. <laughs> but the work of maintenancing, maintenancing us that's ongoing. And the Bible tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So even in his rest, he is constantly pleading on our behalf to the Father. It's anything but leisure but he is resting from the finished work, that he completed the work that God had for him in salvation, in redeeming us to God. And now he intercedes on our behalf. Being seated with Christ is not a position of leisure, leisure but responsibility. Every believer must follow the lead of our Lord and bear the responsibility of his work. So even though Christ is seated at the right hand, he is still working. We have a responsibility, saints. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says this, if any man is going to follow me, he must first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. I'm going to be honest with you. I ain't got no problem with following. <laughs> it's the denying and picking up the cross part that I struggle with. Because we make excuses. We think of all kind of reasons why we can't, why we shouldn't, why I ain't gotta. Well, he ain't doing it. She's not doing it. Why I got to do it? I said, the first step, folks, is deny yourself. That's hard. Then pick up your cross. Then come to me and say, what's the burden you would have me carry, Lord? What is it that you would like to lay across my shoulders? Because what I recognize is even though you lay a burden on me, I continue to lean on you. Because you said your burden is easy and your yoke is light. But we all have a responsibility to have 
purpose in this world. He didn't save you just to save you. He saved you to serve. He saved you to show the excellences of his, uh, excellency of his work in the world. And the only way people get to see that is that you put yourself out there. I, I'm, 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 I'm just about done, um, but I, I want to share this example because I always thought this was really powerful. Dr. Tony Evans gave this example um, in a sermon years ago, and I said, man, that was just one of the best examples I've ever heard in my life. But he said, you know, when he goes to New York, his wife likes to go shopping. And she liked to go shopping, and she'd go to all these stores, and, you know, they would, they would window shop, and uh, she'd look in the window and, and see the mannequins all dressed up, and, and, and that would be the thing that would entice her to go inside. He said, because the people who ran the store knew this. If I can dress up this dummy and put it in the window and position it in such a way that those dummies will see it, be drawn to it, and come inside. I'm all right being a dummy for Jesus. Jesus dresses us up, and he puts us out there for display so that people can see his marvelous work. And as they see it, and as they inquire of it, they are drawn to come inside and see what God is able to do for themselves. But that doesn't happen, saints, unless we take on the purpose that God has for us. So the next slide, I want to ask you a question. When you think about the fact that you've been raised up and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and you have been, there's no question, if you've come to faith in him, you have a seat in heavenly places. My question is, based on how we walk, based on how our ministry is going, based on our life, what chair most closely resembles your seat? Are you whining and complaining? because things don't go your way all the time? Are you still coming with your little spiritual bib on and nibbling at the, the word of God and not fully partaking? Then maybe the high chair is for you. Are you one of those Christians who, well, if I get upset, I don't have a problem with putting my religion on the shelf and giving you a piece of my mind, letting you know exactly where I'm coming from, well, you might be a folding chair believer. <laughs> that I can fold this bad boy up any time and just step on. Maybe you are a recliner believer. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going to take a nap. Or maybe it's a throne. A throne means authority, but it also means responsibility. And so as we reflect this morning on the seat that we have, there's no question. What does my seat look like in terms of my life and my ministry? and what I do for Christ. Saints, I believe you determine that. God gave you a seat. Which one do you pull up to the table? As I close, in Acts chapter 7, it tells the story of Stephen, who was a deacon. Uh, but he also was a preacher. And as somebody who preaches, a lot of times you 
are thinking about and concerned about, are people going to get my message? Are they going to like my message? Are they going to hear my message? Are they going to respond to my message? Stephen preached his first sermon, which ended up being his last sermon. And I, I, I'm not going to go there because of time, but in his sermon, Stephen recounts the history of Israel. And he talks about the leaders in Israel and the people of Israel and how Israel was the people of God and then they were unfaithful to God and God redeemed them and God loved them. And he, he, he goes through the whole history. And he does this for one reason. Because he turns to them and he essentially says, you crucified the Lord of glory and you should have known better. little break in this. I'm reminded of a gentleman who was a violin virtuoso. And he had amassed fame for himself. People came from all over to hear him play. And he was doing a concert and he learned that the maestro, the one who taught him, would be in attendance. And so this man comes out and he plays this concert and he plays beautifully and he received multiple standing ovations. And so he gets to the end of the concert and he pours his heart into this. Every ounce of his skill and knowledge and ability go into playing this violin. And when he was done, the audience stood. But he looked up in the upper part of the auditorium, and the maestro was sitting down. So he picked up his violin, and he, he began to play again, again with passion and fervor, playing his heart out. And the crowd stood, and the maestro was still sitting. At this, the man was brokenhearted, completely broken. And he began to play again. And as he played, emotion, his brokenness, all of that was poured into this instrument. And when he finished, he was spent completely. And his head dropped and tears rolled down his eyes. And he could hear people getting up and thunderous applause. And when he looked up, the maestro was standing and applauding. Why did I share that? In Acts chapter 7, the Bible tells us that Stephen preaches this message and the people who heard it were not happy. It says, as a matter of fact, in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, meaning the Jews, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Check this out. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. The maestro was standing. The master was standing. And I don't know if this is figurative or if this is literal. I like to think that it's literal, that Jesus stood up from his place of authority, that he stood up from his place of intercession, and he saw Stephen, and he said, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I just want you to think for a moment, saints, that as Stephen, the Bible says, as he stood there looking up, he saw Jesus standing there, welcoming him to the kingdom. And I love it, the Bible doesn't say that Stephen died. It says he closed his eyes and fell asleep. What a way to go. Now I'm be honest with you, I don't want to be hit with nobody's rock. 
But when you find yourself where Stephen found himself, full of the Holy Ghost, and looking up and seeing the glory of God, what a way to go. And I would almost bet, not a betting man, that he did not feel any of those rocks hitting him because his focus was on the maestro. We got the best seat in the house. And it wasn't anything that we've earned, but it was given to us by grace. He hath raised us up together and has seated us in heavenly places together in Christ Jesus. This morning, as we leave this place or this afternoon, as we begin to depart, I pray, Lord, that this message resonates. That I am appreciative of what you have done for me and what you have done to me. There may be someone here today that you never trusted in him. You don't know what it means to have a relationship. You don't know what it means to desire to please God. The beautiful thing is you don't have to continue to wonder because his finished work, the work that he completed and then sat down to intercede for you has been done for all of us. I want to encourage you that if you would like to speak with someone regarding faith, that you can call the church at 412-242-3255 and someone will get in touch with you about what it means to live for Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the power of that word. Lord, the transformation power that's in your word. We pray that our perspective, that our purpose, that our power, that your presence would be so very, we'd be so very aware of it, that all we would seek to do is please you. We give you thanks and we praise you for what you have done and what you will do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And God's people said, amen. At this time, we like to bless the offering. And uh, again, we know that people give in a number of different ways uh, here at Bethany. And so some people give online, some people um, you know, may uh, still be writing uh, checks and things of that nature. So um, I believe in the back there is a, uh, somewhere that you can, if you'd like to leave an offering today, uh, that you can do that. But we wanna ask the Lord to bless uh, the offering so that it will continue to be used for uh, his purposes. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We pray, Lord, for those who um, may be struggling right now to, to give. We pray that you would uh, just bless them, Lord, so that they might be in that position to give back to you. We thank you, Father, for the ability to give unto your work and ask that, your wor that you would be glorified through the work that is done. Bless these offerings, Lord, that you might be exalted. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. God's people say, amen. So as we close, I want to again wish you a happy 4th of July. I almost said Thanksgiving. I'm pushing this, year, <laughs> pushing this year along. May you be safe. May you be sound. But may you, more importantly, be sanctified in the work that he has done on your behalf. I'm going to ask that you would rise as we sing the benediction and close out.